Good morning. Welcome to worship on this Holy Trinity Sunday. Uh, for those who feel the need for more social distancing, there's plenty of room up here in the front row. <laughs> Don't be shy. I see the back rows are filling in there. So, uh, yeah, today is, is Trinity Sunday, and uh, this begins what we call the non-festival half of the church year. And traditionally on this day, we confess our faith in the words of the Athanasian Creed. And it's, uh, as you probably know, it's one of the, or it is the longest of the three. So we're going to have bite-sized chunks of it throughout the order of service. You'll see that as, as we go through. So we're not saying it all at one time. Uh, just a word about the Creed itself. Early in the 4th century A.D., there was a pastor in North Africa named Arius. And uh, he began to teach that Jesus was something less than the Son of God. And, of course, the church responded to that with, what we know as the Nicene Creed. That was uh, in the year 325 A.D. And the Nicene Creed strongly states that Christ is indeed a uh, true God. And then later on, the Athanasian Creed emerged, taking us deeper into the mysteries of the Trinity, if, if that's possible. It's attributed to a man named Athanasius, who opposed Arius, uh, but it came much later than the life of Athanasius. So we believe that it reflects what he taught or how he opposed Arius. So that's a little bit about the creed you're going to be professing today. Today we also begin a four-week sermon series uh, that will focus on God's mission in the world. And uh, today we focus on the power behind God's mission. So with that, we begin with that great hymn of the church, Holy, Holy, Holy. Welcome again.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Part one of the Athanasian Creed. Whoever will be saved shall, above all else, hold the Catholic faith. Which faith, except everyone keeps whole and undefiled, without doubt he will perish eternally. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Father, dwelling in majesty and filling creation with your spirit, reveal your glory to all through our Lord Jesus Christ. Cleanse us from all doubt and fear and send us boldly into the world to worship you with your Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, living and reigning now and forever. Amen.
the Old Testament reading for this Holy Trinity Sunday from Genesis, all of Genesis chapter 1 and a portion of Genesis 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, Let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it, and it was so. God called the vault sky. And there was evening, and there was morning the second day. And God said, Let the water under the sky be gathered to one place, and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry, dry ground land, and gathered waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds, and it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years. And let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, Let the water teem with living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea, and every living thing with which the water teems, and that moves about in it according to their kind, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground, and the wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the, lo over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth, and every true tree that has fruit with seed in it, they will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth, and all the birds in the sky, and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. 
And so on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. This is the word of the Lord. Part two of the Athanasian Creed. The Father is uncreated, incomprehensible, eternal. The Son is uncreated, incomprehensible, eternal. So likewise, the Father is almighty, the Son is almighty, and the Holy Spirit is almighty. So the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. So likewise, the Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, and the Holy Spirit is Lord. For we are compelled by the Christian truth to acknowledge every person of the Godhead by himself to be both God and Lord. So we cannot, by the Catholic faith, say that there are three gods or three lords. We continue with the psalm hymn based on Psalm 8. New Testament reading from the book of Acts, chapter 2. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad, and my tongue rejoices. 
my body also will rest in hope, because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. This is the word of the Lord. We stand for our gospel proclamation. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 28th chapter. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is the gospel of the Lord. You may be seated.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for our sermon this morning is our gospel reading from Matthew 28. Did you notice our reading has God's holy name all over it? Did you notice that his name is not just an abstract concept? It's not just a generic title like Lord or King. It's not even similar to that lofty title that was used by the ancient Israelites, God Most High. No, the name given to us here in Matthew 28 is God's proper name. It is the name by which the creator of the universe, as we heard in our reading from Genesis, is most intimately and most fully known. And that name is given to us so that we can, in confidence, call upon it, especially in times of trouble, like right now, in the recent days that our nation has been facing. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. You know, it's no accident that this name, revealed to us by Jesus himself, was given to us in the context of of what we call the Great Commission of the Church. At the end of his earthly ministry, when Jesus had accomplished all that he came for, to give his life for the the life and salvation of God's people, he sends out his apostles. In fact, the word apostle means one who is sent with authority. He says, go, go and make disciples of all nations. Using my word, using the waters of baptism. That word go, it's not just meant for the twelve. All Christians are called in this great commission of the church to go and make disciples of the nations. The late Richard Halverson was the chaplain for the U.S. Senate. And as he studied this verse, he came to this conclusion. As he dug into the Greek, he discovered that what Jesus was really saying here is, as you go, or as you are going, that is through your day or through your week. Halverson wrote this, and I quote, Don't try to drag people into Sunday school or into the sanctuary for worship or into some other program you have at the church. Don't try to lure them into the church at all. Instead, show them the power of Jesus' life in your own life. As you go, Monday through Saturday, he wrote, let them see Christ living in you. Help them to learn of Jesus through the joy and the hope and the love you give away to others. As the people around you see that and are influenced by your faith, they will find their way into the community of believers. End of quote. You see, the primary work of the church is not only what happens here on Sunday mornings, although this is critical as well, but it, it's also what happens out there from between Sundays, out in the world, out where you are. Church is where you are during your work week, where God sends you. Our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is ascending God. Ascending God. Have you ever thought about God in those terms? That he is on the move, and his people are on the move. If you haven't thought about him in that way, maybe you should. In the Athanasian Creed, we confess an eternal movement within the Holy Trinity. Even though we can't understand it, we can't comprehend it, the Father begets the Son. The Son is begotten by the Father. The Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. Do you see it? Do you sense it? Our God is on the move. Our God is taking action. 
And what exactly motivates our sending God? Why does he do what he does? Well, the Bible tells us in one word. It's love. The Apostle John wrote, God is love. And that's the power behind God's mission. We've all heard that a million times, right? God is love. And we say this not only in reference to his relationship with us, us and the rest of the world, but also in the relationship of the three persons of the Holy Trinity. God's love not only begets, God's love is a love that perfectly wills. It's a love that flows from the Father to the Son and then is returned by the Son to the Father. And it's a love that through the Spirit binds together in perfect unity. Without such knowledge and such confidence in the Trinity, we would be lost. Our tendency would be to create gods of power or to make gods out of things in the created world. Think about the Israelites and the golden calf. I guarantee you we would not create a God who lives and loves in a community of love for eternity. But there's even more to our sending and loving God. Just as God moves within himself, just as there is love in and among the three persons of the Holy Trinity, so God also moves out from himself. Why is that a big deal? Well, that means that he loves you. He loves you with the same love that he used in creating and sustaining the universe. Even before the foundation of the world was called into being, God loved you. Our triune God is not aloof. He is not detached from the world he created. He is not self-satisfied. He is not alone. He is not like the statue of the big Buddha we see who's, who's so full that he can't even move. He can't even lift a finger to help. And he's certainly not the God of the philosophers. He is not just a vague idea on paper. No, the God of ancient Israel and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is a loving, sending, and moving God. And he is hungry for the salvation of his people. He is moving us through the wilderness of sin and death in this world and into the glorious freedom and inheritance of eternal life, which is ours right now and forever. So yes, this triune God moves in unity, and it's a unity of love. And it's a love that never ends, even though our first parents, Adam and Eve, rebelled against that love. The Father loves those who have fallen. That's us. The Son redeems those who are loved. That, too, is us. And the Holy Spirit calls and teaches those who are loved and redeemed. That's you. And that's me. So where does this love want to go? It wants to go to all nations. Our sending God says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Or more accurately, he's saying, disciple them. Take my divine word, take it to people so that they become my people. We see here the love that the triune God has is as broad as humanity itself. That means that he loves black people. He loves white people. He loves yellow people. He loves red people. He loves brown people. God loves the nations. After all, for whom did Jesus die? John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of who? The world. The Apostle Paul wrote, One, that is Christ, died for all. And the Apostle Peter confesses something similar. He says, 
For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. If there is anyone who stands as unrighteous before our righteous God, and that's all of us, the promise is your sins are forgiven. You see, the gospel is not just wishful thinking or a pipe dream. We don't say, well, Jesus may have forgiven your sins, so have a nice day. No, it's the announcement of absolute truth and certainty. God is reconciled to the nations through the death and the resurrection of his son. Salvation, salvation has been purchased and won through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, crucified and resurrected. Our Lord Jesus shouted from the cross, it is finished. And that is a cry of victory. And the triune God leaves no doubt as to the scope of this sending. In Acts 1.8, he says, You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the very ends of the earth. Who, me? A witness? Yes, me. And you. And you. And you. And you. And you. All of us here, all Christians, are sent as witnesses to profess our faith in the triune God. And we do that as we are going. As we are going throughout our week, throughout our day. And once again, on this Holy Trinity Sunday, we have the opportunity to profess our faith in this loving and sending God. To profess, it means to say the same thing as another. Where God has revealed who he is and what he has done, and we understand that to be the Holy Scriptures, we say precisely the same thing. No more and no less. And it's good to remind ourselves that professing this faith in the triune God it's not just an intellectual exercise, though it can be because the Athanasian Creed challenges us to think thus about certain truths of the faith. But professing is much more than just thinking. Professing involves the whole person. Why do I say that? Because your whole person, your body, your mind and your spirit have been made new. Your total person has been born again in the waters of baptism. By water and the word, you have been brought into this communion of saints, the Holy Christian Church. The Holy Christian Church receives its life from Christ, who gave his life for her. He loves his church as the bridegroom loves the bride. Do you remember in Genesis chapter 2 how Eve received her life from the side of Adam? It says there that, that God fashioned her out of the rib or out of the side of Adam. Well, in a similar way, God gives life to his church from the side of Jesus. The Apostle John tells us that after Christ died on the cross, a Roman soldier took his spear and thrust it into Jesus' side. And what came forth but water and blood. And then John pauses in, in his account and he writes this. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true and he knows that he is telling the truth. That you also may believe. Just as blood and water poured from the side of Jesus on the cross, the sacraments of holy baptism and holy communion have been given power to, to create faith and to nourish faith in us so that we will believe in him and we will be saved. And where Jesus is, there is his bride. When the church professes faith in the triune God, she professes to 
the sending love of God to the nations, to people of all colors and all ethnicities. Where Christ goes, the church follows with his love. And his love is the power behind the mission. That word mission, it comes from the Latin word missio, and it means sending. A missionary is also one who is sent. And our Lord Jesus sets the tone for us. In Isaiah chapter 48, the prophet quotes our Lord. He says, the sovereign Lord has sent me with his spirit. We take Jesus' words to heart. Just as there is this mysterious and eternal communion of love and sending within the Trinity, so there is in our communion. There is mutual love here. And there is sending among us. The church, the body of Jesus, in this fellowship, we are either sending or we are being sent. As we practice our faith each day, as we live out our baptism, as we receive Christ's body and blood, we are professing our triune God, that he is a loving and he is a sending God, that he is on the move. And we are also sent to be engaged in his mission around the world, a mission that is powered by love. continue with part three of the Athanasian Creed. The Father is made of none, neither created nor begotten. The Son is of the Father, not made nor created, but begotten. The Holy Spirit is of the Father and of the Son, neither made nor created nor begotten, but proceeding.
the whole three persons are co-eternal together and co-equal. We stand for the prayers of the church. Blessed be the kingdom of our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That we may faithfully confess the triune God and find unity of faith with all of our Christian brothers and sisters in this faithful confession, let us pray to the Lord. That we may learn and grow in the scriptures so that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are revealed to us. And we come to believe in the mystery of the Holy Trinity and walk as children of the light. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord that all nations may find peace and unity. That war and violence may come to an end. And justice and freedom may be enjoyed by all people everywhere. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have that the church and all who serve her may be faithful to the God whom we know as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and that God may grant growth to his kingdom through the proclamation of this saving truth. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord that the sick, the suffering, and the dying may have healing, comfort, and peace in Christ. Today, we pray to the Lord for a speedy recovery and or a full restoration of health for Violet Helwig, Nelda Cable, Kent Lucky, Judy Sears, Carl Jenny, and Ron Schrader. We also pray for those whom we name before the Lord now in our hearts. Let us pray to the Lord. that God may continue to restore order to his creation by the preaching and teaching of Jesus Christ, and that many may come to faith through the witness of his people in words of truth and actions of love. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord that we may faithfully use God's good gifts to us and joyfully return to him the offerings that flow from grateful hearts of faith. Let us pray to the Lord. For those celebrating birthdays this week, Jane Bloodworth, Gail Tice, Brandon Leaders, Steve Thurm, Susie Berch, Tammy Petzold, Cody, Cody Breuner, Joel Roth, Tyler Schmidt, Marie Cott, Emery Roth, Levi Schmidt, Evelyn Stelling, and Zachary Word. We give you thanks and praise, dear Lord, for another year of blessings and life for each of them and the gift that they are to our congregation. And we rejoice with Tim and Melody Mauser as they celebrate a wedding anniversary. Continue to bless their marital union with your presence and direction. We also ask for continued days of rain and sunshine and balance so that the crops continue to grow and that those who farm can bless their families and the rest of our nation with bountiful food and drink on our table. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray begging you to grant to us what is wholesome and profitable to us and for our salvation. We trust in your mercy and have confidence in your answer to our prayers through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who Continue with part four of the Athanasian Creed. 
Furthermore, it is necessary to everlasting salvation that he also believe faithfully the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. For the right faith is that we believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is God and man. Equal to the Father as touching his Godhead, and inferior to the Father as touching his manhood, who, although he is God and man, yet he is not two, but one Christ. For as the reasonable soul and flesh is one man, so God and man is one Christ, who suffered for our salvation, descended into hell, rose again the third day from the dead. <coughs> At whose coming all men will rise again with their bodies and will give an account of their own works. This is the Catholic faith, which, except a person believe faithfully and firmly, he cannot be saved. Receive now the blessing of our triune God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord, the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. You may be seated.
Once again, good morning and welcome to all. Uh, just a few announcements here. Of course, uh, we're not passing the offering plates, so there are plates on both sides of the door as you leave. If you want to leave your offering there this morning, you can also uh, give online. Uh, the refreshment committee has uh, some, some goodies out there for you. Donations will go to the Concordia Seminary St. Louis Food Bank. Uh, next week, we'll uh, continue. L through Z will be here at 8.30. You guys will be at the 10.30 service. And on June 21st, that's our Mission Fest Sunday. Pastor Gary Schulte and his wife Stephanie will be our guest speaker. We're working on having that at the fairgrounds. And we're, we'll just have one service, 9 o'clock. Everybody can gather. We can all social distance just fine right there. And then June 28th, who knows? You know, the governor's going to... Uh, I guess make a decision June 15th as to what the next step will be. So um, we'll, we'll keep you posted on that. Uh, Lutheran Youth Fellowship, we're going to meet next Sunday, June the 14th at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, we're going to start in the multi-purpose room. If it's a nice day outside, we're going to do a Bible study and then have an activity and maybe some snacks for, for you all too. So put that on your calendar. We want to get that cranked up again. Uh, last thing, East Perry County Rural Fire Department's annual cookout. There was an announcement up here earlier, I think. Uh, it's going to happen Saturday, June the 20th, noon to 6 p.m. at Hemen Winery. And it is to raise money for uh, equipment upgrades. They need to keep their equipment up to date. There's going to be food, live music, raffle, prizes, face painting for the kids, carryout plates available. So we want to support those who... Uh, protect us and serve us. So great cause there, and I uh, hope we all can make it out there for that. With that, go in the peace of the Lord. We'll uh, dismiss the balcony first and then start again from the back and work to the front. Have a great day.